One car represents maximum off-road capability and generates a wow effect like no other. I'm thrilled to be in Fuerteventura today, and I'm happy this car is finished after a long development period. Today we'll talk about it with Jörn. So let's take a look at the new 6x6. It's finally here. Let's go. What kind of car is it? It's a very impressive car. Lots of wheels. <laughs> lots of wheels, lots of axles, lots of components, a lot of new stuff. You can put more wheels on a G, that's not a spoiler. This is the emboss. Absolutely, it's an impressive car. The 6x6 has a clear standing historically, both in terms of the G and the history of Brabus. It was certainly one of the most impressive Brabus supercars. Many of the old 6x6s found their way to Botrop and they were completely rebuilt from the ground up, both technically and visually. There was never a point since the new G hit the market where we, A, either stopped thinking about building a 6x6 again, or B, customers and fans stopped asking us time and again whether we'd at some point be making a similar car. The question kept popping up when the XLP took off, or when the XLP was introduced, since our G pickup has portal axles. We had already introduced the main characteristics of a 6x6. Yeah, some people made the connection. The Brabus XLP, XL for longer and taller, the P for pickup. It's the highlight we introduced in 2020. We could expect to develop it further, but you never know until it happens. Now it's here and has two more wheels. And some other special features in the area of chassis and frame. We added a lot of new elements through a lot of innovation. We'll get into that in detail. I was about to say, if we use a new G-Class as a base for such a project, the goal is not just to increase its off-road capability by adding two extra wheels at the back, basically adding one axle. We asked ourselves, what can we do to further develop this car, you know, technically, to increase its performance, its off-road capability? and also to make it technically more sophisticated. Exactly. A lot of changes. A lot of changes which we'll go over in detail. A lot was changed in the back, but we'll start with the front. You can tell right away this is not a normal G-Class. Anyone who knows our XLP 900 or the G900 Rocket Edition can spot familiar elements. What did we do? Well, let's start at the front. The Brabus Wide Star front apron is a very well-known component used in various modifications and vehicles. We offer it as a Wide Star kit for every G. The G900 and XLP 900 both have it, as does the P900. It gives it an amazing, more masculine and aggressive look. I love the details, like the additional daytime running lights, the carbon fiber here, but also the winch. It's a special detail that makes the front stand out. And it's got a lot of pull, too. In fact, it's got four and a half tons of pull. Right. So I can pull myself out with the winch regardless of where I am, if that's even necessary with this car. The front immediately shows the car is a very tall ride. It really has a lot of ground clearance. How much are we talking exactly? At the lowest spot of the front axle, it's nearly 460 millimeters. So you have at least 460 millimeters clearance all over, even in the back. And even more in the middle of the car. So that's plenty. We also added the necessary underride protection. So in case the clearance isn't enough, I can slide over obstacles on these sheets because they provide appropriate protection. No problem. It has the same height as the XLP because it's based on the XLP's portal axles. Development essentially started with that. And you know, to be honest, we were two years ahead of the curve. The XLP really showed us how to do a portal axle system correctly. We did the same thing here, but developed it several steps further. And we'll get into that in a bit. But let me put it this way. 
If you're up against a terrain you can't get through with this, then I'd wager it's just about impossible to get through it with any other vehicle. True, it's a beast. Yes, it is. Uh, but we also have to mention that level of comfort you just won't find anywhere else. This combination of, on the one hand, off-road performance and driving comfort even on rough roads is an important point. We knew it needs to be off-road capable. It must be comfortable and perform well. That meant there was a lot riding on the suspension. It gives you a lot of performance and maximum drivability, but also the desired comfort. We tried to merge both these worlds. That's not easy and requires a lot of effort. The number of shock absorbers for a car like this is just crazy. We installed 10 shock absorbers, total. They're all electronically controlled. Compression and rebound are adjustable, including a complex sensor and control unit architecture to evaluate different driving conditions. It's all very complex. The old XLP didn't have one feature this one does. Independent suspension on all three axles. Exactly. That's a mega feature. I really can't think of another word than mega, because it's an absolute first for a G. Achieving that took complex developmental efforts, because you don't want to compromise off-road capability. On the contrary, we do it so the car is as off-road capable as possible. That was one of the main areas we thought could be improved on. At the same time, you don't want to sacrifice driving comfort. Well, at this stage, it's only been driven by us internally. And every one of us who's driven it says it's a very normal ride experience. XLP 900 6x6. We've already talked about XLP and 6x6. We'll have a look at that later. But the 900 is also important. Should we take a look at it? Let's open it up. Nine hundred horsepower, one thousand two hundred fifty newton meters of torque, four point five liters, four and a half liter displacement, eight cylinders. It's a recipe we think is good. That's why we copied it from the G nine hundred Rocket Edition rather than from its smaller brother, the XLP nine hundred. The four and a half liter engine is back at it again. Exactly. It's a popular engine, as you mentioned. Right. And I have to say, I really want to compliment our engineering on the last two, three years. When did we introduce it again? I think the Rocket GT was actually the first car. And I remember thinking, what is this thing? What kind of engine is this? It's unbelievable. And today, we've of course installed this engine family in a variety of Brabus supercars. Yeah, it's an extremely well-performing engine, which, thanks mainly to the Mercedes engine strategy, has found its way into almost any model that's interesting or important for us. It's effortless, it's powerful, and it's emotional. But because it employs direct injection and variable displacement, it also offers good fuel efficiency. It complies with all standards we have to meet in Germany and the rest of the world. That's the current Euro 6 standard with particulate filter. It has everything that's required and mandatory in 2023. It's a great engine, and most of all, what's important for me regarding this topic, it's based on classic engine construction. We increased its displacement from 4 liters to 4.5 liters. We worked on the block, increased bore and stroke, and designed new pistons, connecting rods, and a new crankshaft. It's what we did traditionally many decades ago, well before Mercedes started using turbocharged engines. There's an old saying that goes, the only way to increase power is by substituting displacement with more displacement. And we have remained true to that. I'm still very happy with this engine. It does everything we need it to do. We talk a lot about engine balance. Brabus is not just about making engines stronger and bigger. There are always people who come to us and want cars with 1,000, 1,500 or even 2,000 horsepower. I have to be quite clear. Technically, that is possible. But it is not possible within the bounds of what we as a company regard as sensible. 
für sinnvoll erachten. If we were to do something like that, it'd be a one-off. And on top of that, we have to consider durability and street legality. We would have to make compromises that we don't want to make. When we design an engine, it is a product that has to work not only in Germany, but also here in what's known as a hot country. Fuerteventura is a good example. It also has to work in much more hotter countries. It has to be transportable and work anywhere. We have to consider many criteria beyond pure engine power. Anyone will understand that you don't want to buy a car like this, take it for a spin, drive it on the highway twice, and lo and behold, it has a busted engine. That is why 900 horsepower is the current maximum we're offering. You always understate it and just call it an effortless engine. The engine is not effortless. It's absolutely sensational. I'm a relaxed driver. People say you can't drive 320 kilometers an hour on the highway all day, or 300. I then always answer, they're missing the point. It's about having an engine that lets you shift down, tap the gas slightly in a way that really lets you feel how it surges forwards. It sounds unbelievable and has real power. You can feel the power of this kind of engine across the entire rev band. Sometimes it's best to just drive around at low revs and just enjoy how the engine actually works. You can constantly feel its displacement. Its torque effectively makes it a daily driver. Its responsiveness makes it a joy to drive. That's its strength and the reason we added 500 more cubic centimeter. That helps its responsiveness and increases base torque. It has a lot of emotion in its power delivery, which truly makes it what it is. The topics of engine balance, smoothness and the connection, which is different between performance and comfort, has always played a major role at Brabus. We've always built fast cars that work as daily drivers. They are comfortable, but more importantly, they make you feel comfortable. They don't rattle and bounce, which was much harder to achieve for this car because it's a massive off-roader, not, say, an E900, which of course means a completely different approach. Also, the top speed of 210 km per hour is electronically limited because the 22-inch off-road tires set that limit for us. It's effortless, it performs well, and for a car of this size, that's really incredible. It's fascinating. Let's talk about the power view hood. Funny you should say that. I would have forgotten about it and moved on. It's a new detail and we've already presented some 850 cars together, but it still feels new. I think it's a detail that became normal very quickly, and we see it in a lot of cars. It is so well integrated that you sometimes walk past it and only notice it at second glance. However, to me, it's cool to see the engine through the glass. Here's the engine cover with the red carbon. The red or black carbon differentiates between 800 horsepower and 900 horsepower. If it's red, it's 900 horsepower, and if it's black, it's 800 horsepower. Right, and they're very visible. You can also see the effort of creating such a window and opening, not only from the outside with the hood attachment, which, as you said, visually corresponds exactly to what we offer as an aftermarket accessory for every G. You can also see this massive large carbon insert. We place the air inlets here because the air flows through the slot in the hood attachment and channels into these outlets, which then supplies the engine with air to improve compartment ventilation. Let's address a discussion we often encounter online. These slots in the hood are, of course, functional in the XLP 900 6x6. As with the P900, they always have been. They're fully functional. Yeah, all that air flows in here at the front. I mean, if you look here, it looks like it's closed because there's a separator in the back. You always have the issue of water entering this area. Water in the engine compartment is not good. And that's what the separator's for. The air impacts here is fed away laterally and the water is led away via another vent so that no water can enter the engine compartment. 
You can't avoid it completely, but it is possible to separate it. That means the air enters here and passes through channels in the component to the underside of the hood. Then it's channeled through these slots and once again into the engine compartment to the left and right of the engine. That improves the ventilation of the engine compartment and ensures better thermals. So, Jörn, now we've talked so much about the engine, let's talk about what makes this car truly special. Let's have a look at the sides. Okay, let's close this. It's such a massive car. 6.2 meters? Yes. That's crazy. It's insane. This is not a toy. No, it's definitely not a toy. The three axles, the six wheels, the wheelhouses, they give a really good view of its technology. We made a conscious decision to visually contrast all modified parts of the chassis, frame and suspension. And for those parts, we chose grey as the colour, which makes the answer to the question, what's new, fairly simple. Everything that's grey is new. Independent suspension on all three axles. How many absorbers do we have? Ten? There are ten absorbers, one per wheel on the front axle, just like the XLP. On the rear axle, the independent suspension consists of a dual system. That means two absorbers per wheel. They're all electronically controlled. Compression and rebound are adjustable via a control system with a complex sensor array on the car. We installed acceleration sensors at different key points on the frame, chassis, suspension and the wheel mounts. They evaluate the car's driving state and its movement status. For example, if you're driving on a bumpy or an uneven road, it makes adjustments using the elaborate software. There are two control units. Usually you have one control unit for all absorbers, but no control unit on Earth can control ten absorbers. It's a highly unusual setup. The original 6x6 had two rigid axles at the back. And so, when we started the project, that was the main point of attack. Simply put, if we want to make this car even more off-road worthy and increase its performance, we have to make a move and install independent suspension on all the axles. You were just explaining just how complex that makes this system. You can't just add an axle in the back. You have to integrate everything and tell the car it now has three axles. You have to first develop the technology and harmonize it in such a way that, in the end, when you drive the car, you end up with a homogenous overall impression. It's a topic that has different levels. First of all, there's the mechanical level, which means you have to build an independent suspension. You have to design and develop it and map the kinematics, because you define the wheel movement with the control arms. Because at the beginning you have nothing, you're starting from scratch. Of course, we were able to copy a few things. The XLP has independent suspension in the front, which is installed in every new G. So we weren't quite working in a vacuum. But we did have to design new control arms, wheel mounts and portal casings, even if we could copy some of it from the front. So the mechanical setting comes first, with everything that goes with it. You also need frame adapters. The frame doesn't have independent suspension points. That means it had to be strengthened. We have built a very special subframe which is attached to the modified, extended and rebuilt stock frame at the back to find attachment points for the control arm to grab onto. That's because normally there are no standard points for it. We had to engineer two absorbers per wheel from scratch as well, because once again there were no attachment points to install them on. So that covers the mechanical setting. But we're only talking about the chassis. The next topic is the rigid axle with a differential and a drive shaft in the axle tubes. 
All of these problems you're going to have to deal with if you want to build a 6x6. We talked a lot about the chassis, but if you want to realize an independent suspension on three axles and end up with a drivable car, then, of course, you have to address more than just the chassis. For example, the drive, with the differentials, differential locks, and so on and so forth, which you've also put a lot of work into. You're exactly right. The normal rigid axle has an integrated differential inside the axle tubes and corresponding drive shafts. All of that is gone. Just as the chassis didn't have attachment points for the new components, the same is true of the drive, where we decided to switch from rigid axles to an independent suspension. So we have new differential housings for both axles. The first rear axle is a power divider axle because you're transferring from the front through the first rear axle via the transfer gearbox. You split left and right through a differential and connect the third axle with another output drive where it goes back into a differential via the drive shafts to the wheels. None of those housings existed. The drive wheels didn't exist. The gear wheels and bevel wheels weren't available. All of it had to be created from scratch. New housings had to be engineered and designed. When you develop a drive, there are new gears and differentials, so noise emission becomes a topic. Does it whine or does it make any other noises? And of course, one of the normal topics anyone faces with off-road vehicles is noise generation. What does it sound like? Is it too loud? How much of a compromise do you have to make? We wanted to compromise as little as possible, which worked out well. And it performs well off-road and on the road due to the independent suspension and its elaborate chassis. But let me say a few words about differential locks, because with three axles and six wheels, there's a huge number of locks. Let me put it in simple language. The differential lock firmly connects the corresponding wheels, or rather the axles. I'll explain it by using the example of a trans first lock on an axle. Imagine you're in an off-road situation and there's no load on one of the two axle wheels. A normal open differential would still drive that wheel. That means... Uh, so you're standing on a sloping terrain, or you're driving over a rock, and one wheel... Or over a patch of ice. Yeah, and um, one wheel has no or little ground contact. Right. The differential would, through torque compensation, always drive the wheel with the lowest friction coefficient, which then spins idly. So performance goes to waste. Exactly. You can't move forwards. With the differential lock, you block this torque compensation and then distribute the force equally to both sides. In other words, the force is distributed throughout the rest of the system. So, in a situation where you have two wheels with different coefficients of friction, the wheel with the highest coefficient of friction provides forward traction. You switch that electrically. It's a special feature of the G because it's super comfortable and simply makes a huge difference in off-road driving. And it'll help you get through anywhere. Exactly. Then add three axles, six wheels, and the entire contact surface, and a feature we'll get to in a moment, the tire pressure control system, and you end up where we are now. But again, you need a lot of electronics, because all the axles have to be controlled in each situation. An unsophisticated setup could cause a lot of damage. If in certain moments the toothing gets locked under a big load, it would lead to overload breakages. That's why under certain circumstances, just like with the stock G, you can only switch to neutral at certain limited speeds. Our components make use of that because as comfortable and easy as it is to just press a button, in this case it's dangerous because it is technically complicated and difficult to find the right moment to do so without violent force. Normally the G has a central lock that connects both axles. We've installed a rear and frontal lock. And that's the famous three buttons. Exactly, the famous three buttons. In case anyone is wondering what these three central buttons do in the center console of the G class, which are not normally used in road traffic, what they do is they lock the differentials when you're off-road. And you need that either to solve a problem up front, in the back, or with all wheels. 
ein Problem zu lösen. Wobei es ist ja so. Though in practice, during off-road use, you would first use the central lock, the transfer case, and next the first transverse lock on the rear axle. And then, if you're still stuck, you lock the front axle. So we had to design an additional transverse lock for the third axle. And that's exactly what we did. That means the third axle also has a transverse lock. We decided to make the third axle switchable via a blocking element. This means that under normal road conditions, the third rear axle is not switched on. It's decoupled from the normal drive. That increases maneuverability, makes making U-turns and tight turns like switchbacks a whole lot easier. It just rolls along. Exactly, it rolls along. If you're off-road with the central lock engaged and then switch on the rear transverse lock, at the same time, the third lock is also engaged. Those are the switching options available. In addition, you have the option of activating the rear transverse lock. It is very modular and harmonized selectively for all driving conditions and situations so that you have both. You can drive on the road or even maneuver around a parking lot, which would be difficult with all the axle components, tension and self-locking present in such a system. But if all else fails and you get stuck, you do have the ability to lock the entire system completely. This gives you unlimited off-road traction and the ability to drive up a mountain. If you're stuck, take the three-axle truck. <laughs> Good one. Aww. Your comments on the drive and chassis make me realize this is a very special car. We've always had many discussions about suspension, drive, engine, interior, exterior, wheels, etc., etc. The level of detail of this Tech Talk, as I'm sure you've realized, is a whole lot higher because this car underwent so much development and because it was so demanding to actually realize. To me, that's why it's a special car. I think that a lot of people were really wondering what is so complicated about a G-Class with six instead of four wheels. Well, I think your five-minute explanation helps people understand perfectly. Let's start at the beginning. A car with six wheels instead of four wheels is a better off-road vehicle. Why is that? Because you have more wheels and more contact surface. This gives you the ability to drive out of any situation. As the expression goes, the only connection a car has to the ground are the small footprints of the tires. Off-road capability means you need traction and rubber on the ground in order to drive off. Especially here on Fuerteventura, with extremely stony, gravelly terrain, where you have to drive over rocks and hardly have any traction. It's even difficult to walk here. Every wheel, every contact surface will help you. Just like a centipede that easily distributes weight, traction and strength, a 6x6 has a huge advantage. Another important topic is the interlacing. Yeah, let's explain that to the audience. Interlacing is the position of the axles in relation to each other. Torsion, if you imagine a line from front to back through the car, is how that line is twisted. So torsion that occurs throughout the entire vehicle. Right. Plus the compression travel on the left, right, front and rear, where every wheel is in a weird position because I'm driving over a rock. With six wheels, one of them always finds traction somewhere. If two wheels have little traction on a four-wheeler, you are missing 50%. But here you still have four out of six, if two are lost. Lost in the sense that they don't have enough surface contact. You have 50% more. Right, exactly. Of course, the differential locks, the car's ground clearance with the portal axles, will also play a role. Another important option we offer for this car is the tire pressure control system. 
bieten. Right. But let's go back to a topic you mentioned in passing. We've already explained this for the XLP. It's very helpful. The term portal axle is new to many because everyday life on the street never brings you in contact with it. But the moment you need ground clearance, portal axles become very, very important. So what is a portal axle? Why don't we go have a look in the back, shall we? As we can see, portal axles have a lot to do with ground clearance. As the name suggests, we're building a portal. There are a lot of components that you can see from the front. Jörn, why don't you take us through? Okay. Portal axle 101. Right. As you said, portal means I have to go up, over, and down. So that I have more space under the car and drive better off-road. Exactly. Usually in the middle of the wheel, right about here, is where the drive shaft attaches. That point can be moved up via suitable gears, which are these portals. That means the center of the wheel, where the normal wheel bearing is, and also the center of the brake disc, is still on this plane. You can see here that the drive shaft attaches far above it. Between them, there are suitable gears which distribute the force from the drive shaft down into the portal and then transfer it to the wheel hub. Why do this? So that all load-bearing components which take away space and clearance are moved upwards. This way, only the control arm and damper linkage of the independent wheel suspension actually remain down here. You can see it here in the middle of the vehicle. Here's a prominent protective plate, which is not only underride protection, but also load-bearing. This location of the subframe offers maximum ground clearance, where you would centrally drive over rocks and obstacles. That's the advantage of it. And as we mentioned earlier, even if you slide over an obstacle, this massive stainless steel sheet protects all the essential frame parts. We've just discussed two topics. We've talked about chassis, we've talked about drive. The whole thing is, of course, held together and controlled by a lot of electronics. You can already see one of our acceleration sensors. Jörn, perhaps you can tell us the significance of electronics on this car. I'd like to start with the chassis, since we just talked about portal axles. You just mentioned the acceleration sensor and pointed it out on the wheel carrier. All 10 absorbers on the vehicle are electronically controlled. This electronic control happens during rebound and compression, depending on driving situations. For example, if I'm driving fast on the highway, I'm driving off-road, over heavy obstacles, or just on a gravel road. To control these absorbers as needed, we need relevant information. We've placed various acceleration sensors on the wheel carriers, on the frame, and on the body at points that are important to us. These acceleration sensors detect the relevant forces and movements that occur. For example, on the corresponding wheel where it's positioned or up to the frame. It evaluates the driving situation with complex software and corresponding control units. With the help of characteristic curves, defined absorber control takes place in rebound and compression. So we have these 10 absorbers. Usually, there is one control unit for the chassis control, or rather the absorber control. Uh, we couldn't find a unit that can regulate 10 absorbers. It's just... <laughs> just a bit more than usual. Right, I mean, you don't have the amount of outputs. Everything is always designed for four, maybe six, with two in reserve, but never for ten. So we installed two control units, a master and slave, which share the function accordingly. So a leading control unit and one that creates more capacity and executes what the leading controller tells it to, a so-called master and slave. Right. That way we've supplied all the absorbers, even for this rather unusual architecture. It's integrated into the CAN bus of the vehicle, because in addition to acceleration sensors, we also get information from the vehicle. How fast am I going? How do I have to adjust the chassis? 
What kind of steering movement is there? Am I steering at all? How quickly am I steering? That's also an important parameter. When you're driving slowly in a parking lot or off-road, you don't need excessive damper forces to stabilize the vehicle or the body. So I need to know things like the steering angle. And how quickly am I getting to that steering angle? If I'm executing an evasive maneuver on the highway where I need to quickly... Then I need a different reaction than in the parking lot or off-road. Right. All of that is really exciting because I don't think a lot of people are aware of it. Here you have a car with two, in this case three axles. You get in, turn on the engine, turn the steering wheel and drive off. You don't worry about the role of electronics. Most people think a car is made up of mechanical parts, wheels that are attached to axles, then transfer the power from the engine and spin the wheels. So, as far as they're concerned, the engine spins the wheel. But that's only half the truth for modern vehicles like this one, especially a monster like this one. Without electronics, nothing would spin at all. Certainly not in a way that's drivable. There really are a lot of systems involved, for example, the drive control, engine, transmission and drive control units, comfort electronics, air conditioning, telematics and multimedia in the vehicle. These are all different subsystems that communicate with each other via CAN bus, LIN bus, FLEX bus and LAN. There are systems we had to add to the vehicle because, as we pointed out, the stock chassis control unit can't control 10 absorbers. Plus, we didn't exactly have unlimited freedom in programming. We discussed differential locks and how to control them. All of that is independent electronics, which must be integrated into the existing infrastructure of the G. And that takes us into the area of CAN bus and CAN bus networking. We're connected to the whole vehicle to get all the information we need. So we've talked about many topics, but some are still left. For example, wheels, carbon fiber, the tire pressure control unit, also super exciting. We haven't looked at the interior, but we have an advantage in Fuerteventura. What's better than one XLP? Two XLPs. A black one and a white one. And I think, there it is. Here it comes. Why don't we take a closer look at all that? And we're back with a beautiful black car and a beautiful white car. We brought two cars to Fuerteventura, namely the black XLP 906x6 and the white XLP 800 6x6, because we want to test both engines on this terrain. Which do you prefer? Well, I know which one you prefer, so I won't even ask. That's <laughs> simple. Of course it's the black one. That goes without saying. You know, to be fair, I like the white one a lot, but the black one is great too. You always say the components show up better on the white one. The contours show up more. You're right. You're always or often right. Well, not always. <laughs> Let's talk about the topics we didn't address with the black one. One of them is carbon fiber. We used a lot of carbon, not all of which is visible. What do you say we look at the cargo bed? As you say, uh, the entire side panel, the whole fender, except for the visible carbon fiber parts here, is painted carbon fiber. It's one of the largest carbon fiber components we make. We do that together with CSP, our subsidiary, which is responsible for producing our carbon components. Together with the crawler's side panel, which was also impressive. Those are two of the largest components we produce so far. Right. What's special about this is, normally like we would do with the wide star, the wider fender, or this area here, would be separate. Here we used a single component. It's a single component from front to back, down to this edge. Another level, technically. Absolutely. The depth, the length, the overall dimensions. The moment a component goes from being D to 3D, it becomes more and more complex and tricky. Right. 
This is a crucial component. It covers the much larger cargo bed compared to the XLP 800 or 900. Not 6x6, but 4x4. And you can see here just how big the cargo bed is. Here we have a massive two-part metal roll bar, like the one installed on the XLP. It's a dual configuration because of the length of the cargo bed. We needed some... It's much longer than the 4x4 XLP. LPs. Exactly. So there are two. Here's another special component. Let's zoom in on this frame. Not the visible carbon fiber part, but the frame around it. It's made completely of carbon fiber, goes around the entire car, and is designed to create a nice visual transition to the cabin. When discussing the XLP, we talked a lot about proportions. In this case, the cargo bed and everything in front of it has to fit together proportionally. So the car ultimately creates a homogeneous overall impression. This component definitely supports that idea by creating a clean transition. Yes, plus it pushes the cabin to the rear. We had to try different configurations until the proportions became as suitable and harmonious as the XLPs. I should mention one more thing, though. The overhang in the back is shorter. You'll remember we extended the XLP 4x4's overhang to improve its proportions. And to lengthen the cargo bed. Right. Here that's not necessary because the wheelbase and axles may provide enough space. Right, exactly. And that's why you see the G standard overhang again. That's another special feature. The main difference between the white one and the black one? The white one has a tire pressure control system, which lets me decrease or increase tire pressure with the push of a button. We'll have a look at that and talk about the wheel as well. I'll start with the wheel. We have different wheel designs for the 6x6. This is the brand new Monoblock CHD. On the other hand, we chose the well-known Brabus Monoblock HD for the black XLP900 6x6. With that wheel, there is no way to connect a tire pressure control system. Our 20-inch wheel and tire variants have always had the option to connect a tire pressure control system. This version of the Monoblock ZHD now offers the possibility to combine that system with a 22-inch wheel. Previously, that wasn't possible. You can tell by its looks alone. It's a wheel that tends to withstand more than many of our other wheel designs. It was specifically developed for off-road use. Relatively many and thick spokes, a lot of material. I mean, this thing is really solid and therefore suits a car like the 6x6. For one, we considered its static design because of the high axle and wheel load such a car has, but also the topic of dynamics. It's being driven off-road, but sometimes at high speeds as well. Yesterday we drove it on open sand at well over 140 kilometers per hour. These stresses have an impact on both tire and rim materials. So they have to be designed so they can withstand such loads. Another special feature here, we need an air channel for inflating and deflating the tire. That means we have to internally connect the rim well to the wheel hub. There's a bore in one of these spokes. Please don't ask me which one. The bore runs inside from the rim well to the center of the wheel hub. Behind this cover is the connection for the tire pressure control system, which runs via the wheel hub. Let's just open it up. Now we can see. Yeah, we opened it up. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. It's easier without the cover. Yeah, and now we can see where the bore is. And now I won't have to guess. But it's just like you said. Here's the bore which goes through the spoke and then runs into the rim well. The air supply runs through there. Here in the wheel hub we have the connection to the tire pressure control system. One of four corresponding pressure accumulators is connected here. It's a tank that stores pressurized air. We've installed four of them in total. The compressor is located up here behind a panel of the cargo bed. Essentially, it pressurizes this entire system. 
unter Druck setzt. When deflating, the air is discharged into the environment. When inflating, air from the pressure accumulators is added via this hose. We found a really cool solution for pressure control, which is something I prioritized in development. We use stock pressure sensors. The same mandatory ones you find installed in any car these days, the tire pressure monitoring sensors. We import that data via CAN into a control unit with suitable circuitry and electronics. You then select road pressure of 2.3 bar, for example, down to 1.1 bar for off-road pressure. One more important thing, all our rims developed to connect to a tire pressure control system have a special design in the rim well regarding the rim hump, the edge that holds the tire on the rim from the inside. It's a so-called extended hump, which means it's larger than the ones used on standard rims. It prevents the tire from jumping into the rim well from the inside. Normally, you would risk the tire jumping off the rim if the air pressure is too low. Our design prevents that. The minimum air pressure for the 6x6 is 1.1 bar. It's monitored by electronics, that's the minimum setting. And it also has speed monitoring. So if you're driving faster than 100 km per hour for a while, the pressure is automatically raised to the road pressure setting. This is proof that electronics play a huge role in the car. Plus. It brings up a topic we mentioned earlier, a vehicle's surface contact area, which connects it to the ground. It's why we deflate the tires when going off-road. It's ultimately a component, an option and feature I need. If I design this vehicle for maximum off-road capability, more than it already is because of the additional axle, I need to include the tire pressure control system because it enables me to tweak the contact surface. That's why you deflate the tires when you drive into the desert or on terrain like this. When you drive on difficult off-road terrain, to maximize the contact surface so you can utilize it more or utilize it better to keep moving. That's what it's all about. You hit the nail right on the head. The fact that we've explained more features on this car than during any Tech Talk before explains the fact that it's taken us a really long time to get to one of my favorite topics, and that is the interior. Yeah. We have installed very exciting interiors in both cars. We normally like to present vehicles like the XLP 900 6x6 in two different color configurations. We did it with the Rocket GT and the G900 Rocket Edition. And now we're doing it again with the 6x6, the 900 in black and the 800 in white, to show the different impact various colors can have, and to give a representation of two different interiors. At launch, two exterior colors and two different interior configurations are available. Right. One of them has the tire pressure control system, the other doesn't. But let's have a look. Let's open it up so we can check out the interior. And you notice the running board extending. Well, it's a bit noisy right now because there's a lot of sand in it. It's been used a lot. You really need them for this car. They really make sense because they make getting in quite easy. Both cars have different interpretations of the interior, but they're the same in scope. Even if the colors are different, the 900 is all black with gray accents. This one is all about contrasts. The exterior is white, the interior black. We've added a lot of beautiful red elements, including all of the parts with a glazed finish, which really stand out, of course. Yes, as you just said, there's really a lot of contrast. The black with the red glaze finish is not an unusual combination. We already used it in the G900 Rocket Edition. I think it's good and important that we show two cars, something with just a little and something with quite a lot of contrast. So, at the end of the day, the customers can decide what they want. So, these are two proposals and launch colors. That doesn't mean you have to configure the car this way. Anyone who configures a 6x6 can choose freely. Few companies reach deeper into the trick box, or let's call it the configuration box, than we do. It happens again and again, this sort of one-off philosophy Brabus is known for. We make everything possible, and we want to be those who never say no. Whether it's a special exterior color, a crazy color, and material concept for the interior, 
The list goes on and on. We've made a lot of things possible, as long as they're safe. Exactly, that's always the top priority. Of course, features like airbags have to be included. We secure them, which is why there are restrictions regarding some seams and seam lines. They have to be the way they are because they are functional seams. But with the rest, the choice is yours. You can choose different piping, double stitching, and what's more, you could even choose different thread thicknesses. We can make all that possible on request. Come on, let's get in. Let's do it. It's a Brabus masterpiece, as with any major release, meaning we've done literally everything. Exactly. We've done everything we can do, everything we offer. The complete scope, including headliner, sun visors, e-pad, center console, door panel, seating. How many individual parts are we talking about? When you completely take this car's interior part and work on it in some form before putting it back together? If we break it down, I can comment on individual assemblies, but that doesn't include every single panel of the seat. But altogether... All together, well, we have a total of 180 main parts for the interior. Some of those are subdivided another five times. So when you add it up, that means well over 1,000 leather parts. And since it's a G model, add just under 300, so around 280 glaze parts. That means we handle thousands of G-class parts just to create a single 6x6. Six six. All of that makes it super elaborate. Just look at this steering wheel. We have to disassemble each of these little switches, disassemble the switch units, every single part down to the smallest frame so that in the end the finish can be applied. And then as a final step everything gets reassembled. It goes through quality assurance both before and after. Yeah, and because of that, it really looks like you'd expect a piece of jewelry to look. I literally mean that. It looks exactly like what you would expect a high-quality watch, earring, bracelet or necklace to look like. I think every detail, especially where precision mechanics are involved, it all looks exactly as it should. And at the end of the day, that always comes across in a way that immediately answers all questions when you get into the car. The impression is overwhelming. I'd say the scope, the complete approach, even the red. I'm always a fan of this red finish. Combined with the black, it just looks amazing. Other manufacturing processes contribute as well. For example, there's the quilting perforating, position perforating, embroidery, clearly visible in the door panels, combined, of course, with, let me call it our most recent leather design theme, embossing. You can see it on the sun visor, too. Right. Here we embossed our brand pattern, the inverted 77. We embossed Brabus lettering in the side of the center console. There is not a single, now I'm not sure, I could be wrong, but I don't think there's a typical leather working and design process we didn't use. Everything is included. That's exactly what a Brabus masterpiece is all about. Amazing grained leather, which creates more structure and depth and looks great. Red piping in different places, amazing red parts with that glaze finish. You can see some of them here, the small logos on the air nozzles, which are intricate parts that look great. Remember, making everything red is not the problem. To put everything together in the car, in the same color, side by side, is a huge challenge. We're dealing with hundreds of parts. The combination of carbon fiber and leather on the steering wheel looks absolutely amazing. And of course, our Panerai analog watch. Now that's a very nice a very detail. nice detail, right. The door panels are sensational, with a combination of embroidery, quilting, and a metal logo. Once again, this worked very well. We did it for the first time in the GLE 900 Rocket Edition, using this variant, black with red. And it really has become one of my absolute favorite configurations. We also need to talk about our new quilting pattern, new in quotation marks. Right. It's not actually new to our group if you consider all our activities. The triangle originates from the world of Brabus Marine and is being used in a car for the first time. 
It looks completely different because of the red darts. Normally we use it on the Shadow 900 with a different base material because we have to deal with effects caused by the sun, salt or sweat, all the things you'd encounter outdoors. It's actually a great example of how different areas of our company complement each other. In recent years, many new ideas were applied to the boats, and now they're coming back. The more segments we attend to, the more we can share ideas, from cars to motorcycles, from motorcycles to boats, then back to cars. I really can't wait to see what's next. It's one of the most complex cars we've ever built, and one of the longest tech talks we've ever done together. And boy, am I exhausted. <laughs> I think it's even the longest. This thing is absolutely sensational. We've put so much work into it, and it has so many features. We really needed the time. You have to take the time in order to explain everything in detail. And you know what? I am so curious to see the response to this car when we finally present it. On June 29th at Signature Night 2023. I'm really looking forward to it because there are just so many innovations. Absolutely. We still have a few irons in the fire. Otherwise, what's left to say? Well, we still have to drive it. But because we took so long, we won't do that in this Tech Talk, but in a separate video. We'll take it for a spin in Fuerteventura. Thanks for your patience. See you next time. <laughs> take care.